At the beginning of this decade, Dr. Brill took his skills as biochemist, microbiologist, molecular biologist, and ecologist, and moved to the industrial world of biotechnology. He now serves as vice president of research and development for Agricetus. This company focuses on ways to use plant and animal biotechnology to improve agricultural productivity. Just this past week, Agricetus has received approval to field test a product that is an application of bioengineering technology. Dr. Brill gives us the perspective of the bench scientist who has asked, how does it work, to the applied scientist who asks, how can we constructively use it? We are honored that Dr. Brill has accepted our invitation to join in this year's Nobel Conversations. He will speak on the impact of biotechnology and the future of agriculture. Dr. Brill. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Lambert. What I'd like to do this afternoon is show you or convince you that biotechnology is opening up some very exciting new approaches to improve agriculture. And not all I'll be talking about will be uh, on the upside because there's a little bit of a problem that's occurring, and that is uh, concerns about this technology, and I'll be spending quite a bit of time on that. In fact, you'll probably think I'm a little bit too defensive about things. I'll try to put these concerns into perspective. Uh, before I go into the subject matter, I think it's important that I educate you and make you all molecular biologists. And so if you can stand around for one minute, uh, I'll have the first slide, please. represents the chromosome. And the chromosome contains the genetic material of all living organisms. The chromosome is made up of a chemical called DNA, and the chromosome is segmented, made up of many segments. Each segment is a gene. And in a living cell, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of different genes. Each gene codes for a different protein. And a living cell is living, is doing its thing because of the complement of proteins that it contains. So it is the proteins that take up food uh, into a cell, that digest the food, allow the cell to make more of itself and become larger or duplicate. A fish cell has a different complement of proteins than a human cell does. And that has a different complement of proteins and therefore a different complement of genes than, say, a tomato cell. So there are thousands, tens of thousands of different genes, each coding for different proteins. The next slide, the next slide please. Okay. What exactly is a genetic engineer? Well, genetic engineering is gene splicing. That is, you saw those little segments. It's possible to take a segment out of a gene, out of a chromosome. And in fact, it's possible to take a segment out of a chromosome from any animal, plant, or microorganism. And the exciting part of this technology is that one can take that gene out, can purify it, and can put it back into a different organism. Uh, now it's possible to put genes into only a few different kinds of organisms, but the number of organisms that are becoming amenable to this technology is increasing. Very exciting developments from genetic engineering, a technique that's just a little over a decade old, uh, include uh, mostly in basic research. We're learning about evolution of organisms through understanding the genes and examining these purified genes. We're understanding uh, the basis of development, how cells develop. We're learning a lot about diseases, how certain microorganisms cause disease. We're learning about how cancer, or at least how some cancers work, and how some viruses work. So that's very, very exciting. Uh, 
And the next slide, please. This cartoon says, This place is all right. Two more weeks and I'll be a molecular chemist. The point I might want to make with this is that this technology really isn't that sophisticated. That high schools have laboratories in which recombinant DNA or genetic engineering or gene splicing, they're all different words for the same thing. High schools are being, in, more and more high schools are getting involved and there was just recently in Cold Spring Harbor, I believe, a course for high school teachers. In many developing countries, there are laboratories involved in genetic engineering. In all of our major universities, throughout the world, there are dozens and dozens of laboratories involved in the technology, and certainly lots of industries are involved. There's even a home genetic engineering kit, I hear, that, that is for sale. So the genie is out of the bottle, and probably is impo impossible to put it back. Uh, if somebody wanted to, they could set up a genetic engineering lab without too much trouble in their basement. Next slide, please. Well, what's different from, from the perspective of biology, not so much for chemistry or engineering, are the commercial interests in the technology as the technology is developing. And I think before I go into agriculture, I'd like to make a point of what genetic engineering can do, and I'll do it taking a healthcare example. I'll take it because it's one of the first examples, and human healthcare is really where most of genetic engineering applications have been directed. Uh, there's di certain diabetics need the insulin, which is a hormone. Insulin is a protein, and therefore there's a gene that codes for insulin. The diabetics are given, inject, they generally inject themselves daily with insulin that has come from the pancreases of slaughterhouse animals, such as cattle and sheep. And in most cases, that's fine. But animal insulin is slightly different than human insulin. And there are certain diabetics who develop reactions or allergies to these animal insulins, and it would be very nice if they could treat themselves with human insulin. But there's not that big a source of human pancreases. Now, what scientists have done is to isolate the human insulin gene from human cells, put that gene into a bacterium, into a microorganism, and then grow that microorganism in a big fermenter, a fermenter such as is used in the brewing industry. In other words, a big batch full of liquid, uh, full of nutrients for the microorganism. So the microorganism grows, it now has a new gene in it besides all of its other genes. And so the microorganism is pumping out insulin. And when the vat is all, when the cells are all grown up, then the uh, laboratory harvests the material and purifies the protein, human insulin, and can end up with pounds of pure human insulin. Human insulin that's exactly equivalent, exactly the same as the insulin that's in a normal body. And this is now being sold, as, it's called Humulin, sold by Eli Lilly and company. And there are a number of other proteins that are being produced, but I, I won't discuss those. Well, most of the early applications in agriculture, which is the focus of this talk, are going to be in the animal health care area, just because as I said before, almost all of the work is being done in human health care, and there's spin-offs that can easily be, easily be applied to animal problems. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay. And, and the next slide. Here are some headlines of some of the things, I'm gonna be sure I don't trip over anything, okay. Uh, some of the things that are going on. Uh, here is bovine interferon. Interferon is a protein that's made in extra extraordinarily small amounts. 
in animals, in this case the cow. And it's been impossible to purify enough to do any kind of substantial studies with it. Through genetic engineering, the uh, bovine interferon gene has been isolated, been thrown into a microorganism, the microorganisms grown in fermenters, and pure bovine uh, interferon is produced and is being tested now as a possible protective agent uh, to be used in, uh, in cattle to protect them from shipping fever, a commercially important disease. Uh, another example is uh, vaccines. Some vaccines are being produced, and there's one of the first genetic engineering products sold is a vaccine against pig scours, a disease of baby pigs, made through genetic engineering. Not the pigs, the vaccine. Uh, here's another vaccine, foot and mouth vaccine. There's a virus that is potentially a very, very bad virus for cattle, and uh, good vaccines aren't available through genetic engineering. There are groups trying to make uh, very effective and safe vaccines against this disease. Here's another uh, gene or another protein, bovine growth hormone. Again, uh, there's a gene that makes this hormone. The hormone's a protein, and the protein's made in extremely small amounts. Now, one can make pounds of this bro bovine growth hormone and in fact, this hormone has been uh, injected into cattle in, in a test at Cornell. And it turns out that cattle sub grow substantially faster when injected with the bovine growth hormone. And they also produce, I think it's 30 or 30 or 40 percent more milk than the controls. Well, all these examples, we're talking about taking a gene putting that gene into a microorganism and growing that microorganism in a fermenter. What about genetically engineering the animals themselves? The next slide, please. Okay, these are uh, mice, and the smaller mice are normal mice, and the larger mice, in one case, has been genetically engineered. So it hasn't been injected with a growth hormone. It's been engineered with the gene that produces growth hormone. In one case, it's been genetic, it was genetically engineered with a human growth hormone, and in another case, with a rat growth hormone. And you can see these mice uh, are larger than the ungenetically engineered controls. The way this is done is by uh, injecting the foreign gene into a new, a freshly fertilized embryo, and then putting that embryo into a female that will give birth to the genetically engineered animal. Uh, in many cases, the animals are sterile, but in some cases now, the animals are fertile, and the progeny from these animals retain the foreign gene. This is far from an art. Uh, there are tremendous complications in, in all of these, so it's, it's not a simple matter to get something like this. But obviously there have been some successes. The United States Department of Agriculture is tr has genetically engineered pigs and sheep with growth, growth hormones, and there's no data yet on whether these animals are bigger, at least no data I know about yet. There are obviously some problems that people are thinking about from these types of experiments. For instance, faster growing animals require more feed. And so uh, milk producing areas, uh, areas that, that have uh, milk producing cattle, or areas that have these animals, these cattle, if we're trying to genetically engineer cattle, uh, will, that are close to the feed growing areas will have a competitive advantage over the areas where feed has to be shipped. In Australia, there's activity where they're trying to genetically engineer sheep to grow larger. And there's concern whether these sheep, now that they're larger, will put a greater strain on the very fragile environment by compacting the soil more and creating potentially uh, more erosion. Uh, 
Well, these are questions that are being discussed. I want to put it a little bit in perspective. Traditionally, uh, we have been breeding and applying uh, nutritional science to increasing the weight and increasing the rate of growth of our farm animals so that the end products are really the same. There's some concern that, that this ought not to occur, this technology ought not to occur. It's unnatural, which it is because uh, a population, let's say eventually of cattle that have been genetically engineered uh, to grow faster would not have occurred without man's intervention. But the cattle of today, in fact, all animals that we use, whether it's our pets or our farm animals, are all the products of human intervention. And you wouldn't see herds of any of these animals looking anything like they are now uh, if it weren't for man, man's agriculture. Uh, I'm going to slip back into a healthcare situation, but I, I, I want to make a point, And I think the best way of making that point is with the next slide. What is, I mean, I'm trying to focus on the unnaturalness of this. Uh, what is natural is opposition to a certain extent to every new technology. And this is a picture, this is our satirical cartoon about 1800, and it's a cartoon of Edward Jenner in England who is injecting people with, with smallpox, the smallpox vaccine. And you can see that, uh, first of all, it's vaccine pock, hot from the cow. It says on, it's labeled on this little pot here. What it is, it's pus from the cow that has been, that has cowpox. And so he's injecting this into, the, into people. At the time he was doing this, approximately 30% of English babies uh, died from smallpox. Now nobody in the world dies from smallpox because of this vaccine. Uh, this cartoon is just an example of the problems that Edward Jenner had. He was, uh, he was ridiculed and he was almost thrown out of his society, phys physician society, medical society, because he was doing this. Because people thought it was unnatural. And you can see little cows coming out of people's arms and legs. Uh, the next slide, please. Well, I'll now start talking about plants, because that's the area that I'm mostly involved with. And the next slide, this is how uh, plants are genetically engineered now. Uh, it's possible to isolate a single plant cell, let's say from a leaf, and this rod represents a chromosome. And one can add a foreign gene to a single cell, and the foreign gene can be incorporated now as one gene, remember, into tens of thousands of genes. Uh, in the cell, and it's possible to take a cell like this, uh, give it certain nutrients and hormones, and you can have that cell grow and eventually become a normal plant, a normal fertile plant. And seeds from this plant now will contain the foreign gene, and so the gene will be transferred from generation to generation through the seed. The kinds of genes or properties people are now trying to put into plants include genes that will make the plants more resistant to diseases, genes that will allow the plants to require less applied fertilizer. You know, a lot of the fertilizer that's added to the farms after a heavy rain ends up in our streams and rivers to pollute uh, their major sources of water pollution. Uh, people are trying to improve the nutritional quality of crop plants, also trying to make plants more resistant to drought and a number of other properties. So we're at the very early stages of plant genetic engineering, but there's more and more activity, and certainly over the next decades there will be some very exciting and applied uh, results.
The next slide, please. Well, people are, including my company, and even before I was involved in the company, people uh, are making discoveries in laboratories that pertain to agriculture. And it's very important, and I think people who don't, know, don't really think about agriculture don't realize this, but it's very important that as soon as somebody has a discovery, that they field test it as soon as possible. And the reason for that is that if you see something that looks as if it's, let's say, disease resistant in a laboratory or greenhouse, more often than not, when it's out in the field, the resistance uh, doesn't pan out. And the reason for that is that there's no way to mimic, even in the best of greenhouses, there's no way to even closely approximate all the uh, environmental activities that are going on uh, in a, with a plant in the outside, in nature. So it's crucial that plants or microorganisms go out into the field before one wastes more money finding it up so it just works in the greenhouse and won't be used in the field. And this is, these aren't genetically engineered plants, but these, this is just a small plot. These are just soybean experimental plots. These are very important. And uh, a number of laboratories and companies have been frustrated by the difficulty in trying to get experiments, get permission to put experiments out in the field. The next slide, please. Well, there have been some concerns about putting organisms out in the field, because up to now, the organisms, uh, the, uh, let's see, the organisms that produce insulin, these are grown in fermenters and they're contained. Uh, the organisms themselves, the genes, aren't put out into the field. Uh, nobody's really concerned, at least I haven't heard any concern about putting a genetically engineered cow out in the field. But people are, concer are concerned about putting plants and microorganisms out in the field. And in some cases, uh, there's some degree of rationality in the discussions and its concerns, and in some cases, they are not. The fears, I think, are mostly due to fear, or the concerns are mostly due to fear of the unknown. The next slide, please. It says, if you can't read this, not only am I against evolution, but I'm not so sure about gravity and relativity either. I'm not really, well, I am making fun of politicians, but I, d I don't mean to in this manner. What, what's happening is that some of the more vocal concerned people have triggered politicians to, to be excited about this area. And the politicians don't have the background and also don't seem to have the patience, I'm talking in general terms, uh, to listen to all sides of the arguments. In other words, they're concerned potentially with uh, this could be dangerous, and that's all that they, at least some of them, may need to trigger holding uh, hearings and to potentially come out with some laws and regulations that may not eventually benefit the country. So it's very important for people involved to uh, talk to the politicians or somehow talk to the people who work with the politicians to educate them on, uh, on any issue that's, that's uh, where they have some expertise. And it's important for people involved to discuss the issues to be sure that irrationality does not take the day, carry the day. And what I will try to do is to convince you that putting such organisms out into the environment uh, is no concern for, uh, is, should be no special concern. And what I want, what I'll start doing is comparing 
what we are, or what's going on now from traditional agriculture to what might occur from a plant genetic or microbial genetic engineering experiment. The next slide, please. Okay, this is a normal Midwestern corn. Boy, it sure looks big up here. And this is a plant called Teosinte. This is presumed by some to be the progenitor of corn. These two plants would not cross naturally. This is found growing wild in Central America. But there are scientists around the world that are growing this plant and are trying to breed characteristics from Teosinte into corn. For instance, disease resistances that this plant has that we'd like to have in our corn. Uh, for crosses between crop plants and exotic species have been going on for many, many decades. So people are growing commercial, crossing commercial tomatoes with a little black berries that nobody here would ever recognize as being a tomato, but it happens to be a distant relative of tomato to try to improve these crops. Okay, the next slide, please. This is what occurs in a cross. And each one of these represents, this represents, let's say, teosin, a corn. This represents teosinte, its chromosome. And each segment represents a gene. And remember, there are tens of thousands of genes. And when you cross a corn with a teosinte, you can see that you're mixing up genes randomly one cannot predict what the progeny would look like until the experiment is done. And all the progeny are different from each other. Now in a genetic engineering experiment, one, let's say we have, this is corn here, one could take a gene and splice it in right here. And of course the big difference is that gene can come from any organism. Whereas in a cross, they have to be somewhat related. But you see, when you put that gene in, uh, it's very specific. You can predict, in fact, that's the purpose of doing the experiments. You can predict what the progeny would look like. Somebody went through all the work of isolating the gene. They know where it comes from. They know what it does. So one could predict what the progeny would look like. Uh, the progeny would all be the same. And it isn't random, as it is in crosses. Now, even in the case of crosses, breeders aren't concerned when they cross teosinte and corn. No precautions are taken. Uh, even though somebody can argue, well, how do you know that if you cross a teosinte and corn, you won't come out with some very terrible weed? And the reason breeders aren't concerned is because of all the decades and decades of experience with innumerable crosses uh, done in many, many countries by sophisticated and not so sophisticated uh, people that problems have not occurred, at least ser not prob serious problems on the order of something that would really frighten us, uh, that has not occurred. There have been problems from breeding, and there will be problems from genetic engineering. And examples would include, uh, say, breeding or genetically engineering uh, a, an organism, a plant for resistance to a disease. And we may it may turn out later, and there are examples of that, that all of a sudden now it's susceptible. While you have made it resistant, you've made it susceptible to another disease. And those kinds of problems will occur have occurred, and in fact, that's the breeder's profession, is to uh, look for these problems and to field test in first small plots in a couple of locations and then larger plots in many more locations. And so this field testing has to occur before any crop is acceptable. And that will continue even though plants have been genetically engineered. So there are no special concerns, and there are also no special regulations for traditional breeding. Uh, so what's, what's the, why am I so excited about all of this? 
Well, people have mentioned and pointed out the fact that some organisms are dangerous. They cause tremendous problems. And some people have said that those organisms can be considered as models from what might occur through a genetic engineering experiment. For instance, the, the Japanese beetle. I mean, here's an organism that's caused tremendous commercial problems. Uh, Dutch elm disease, the elm bark beetles, caused tremendous problems. The hydrilla in the south that's been clogging waterways. The next, sli next slide. Here's uh, a hillside in Pennsylvania that's been wiped out by the gypsy moth. Another very serious problem. The next slide, please. This is uh, the kudzu vine in the south where this uh, plant is a terrible weed, and here you can see it killing, choking out trees. So uh, everybody knows that organisms, some organisms can wreak havoc. Well, what's the relevance of these types of organisms to what might occur from, a genetic, engine from genetic engineering work? Well, these organisms, are not, organ are not problem organisms because man has genetically manipulated them. These are problem organisms because they were imported from another country. They came into the United States. In their native country, they had evolved over eons uh, to be competitive. That's why they survived. But they didn't take over because there were natural limiting factors, such as other plants, uh, weather, pathogens, and so on. They became problems when they came into the United States. In the case of kudzu, uh, it was China, I guess China, Japan, and then United States. Uh, they became problems when they came into the United States and one or more of the natural limiting factors was missing. And so in these cases, they took over and have caused and continue to cause serious problems. It, I think it's important to tell you that almost every crop we grow in the United States and almost every plant that you have uh, as an ornamental plant in your house were imported from uh, from outside of the United States so that uh, very most plants imported have been valuable but there have been examples of serious problems. Now there's scientific basis to believe that by genetically engineering a corn or a wheat or a rice that one wouldn't inadvertently come up with a plant that could cause as much damage as teosinte. In other words, it'd become a serious problem weed. A serious problem weed isn't, isn't a serious problem weed because it contains a single gene. It, can, it, it has to have a variety of problems, and I'm being very general, but it has to have problems such as, for instance, the seed would have to uh, overwinter or survive for a long time. The seed has, may have to be dispersed over a long distance. Uh, the plant would have to grow faster, be more vigorous than other plants around it, so it can take over. This isn't, these properties aren't due to one gene, they're due to hundreds if not thousands of genes. And it's not just, not just the presence of these genes, but it's these genes interacting in a very, very orderly, specific fashion. So, how could one imagine that by taking one or several genes from any organism, one could convert corn into a real problem weed like this? Uh, it's my view that the chance of producing a problem weed through genetic engineering is less than the chance of producing a problem weed in a teosinte corn cross, which nobody is concerned about. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's a, I'm switching topic now, topics. I'm talking about microorganisms. Uh, this is the first page of an advertising brochure put out by the National Nitroculture Company in Pennsylvania. And they're advertising bacteria, specific for alfalfa in this case, that do nice things for alfalfa in the field. This claim, it says, the greatest discovery of the century. This claim really isn't as great as it seems, since this was printed in 1904. 
And so it's no big deal, I guess, to have the greatest discovery in four years. It's a much bigger deal to have the greatest discovery now. But I'm using this just to demonstrate that microbes have been added to our fields since, in the United States since the turn of the century. The next slide, please. Here's an alfalfa field uh, treated with such a microbe. It's called rhizobium in this case. And here's one that wasn't treated. So it's apparent that some microorganisms uh, have dramatically benefited agriculture. The next slide. These are canisters of inoculants, microorganisms. This is for soybeans. This was made in 1918. This is for clover, 1938. And here's one against uh, for horticultural crops. That was about seven years old. Uh, in the United States, since the turn of the century, there have been hundreds of products, microbial inoculants, that farmers have put out in their fields. And they put on the order of a billion of these microbes per acre. Uh, in some cases, the products are good and some not good. And one can imagine for the hundreds that have been uh, used commercially, one can say that perhaps 10 times or even 100 times more have been used experimentally. So that over the l last uh, 80 years, just in the United States, there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of microbes that have been grown up in fermenters and have been applied in very large numbers to farmers' fields. In India, uh, the inoculant business, and in Russia, the inoculant business was even greater than in the United States. In no ca and in many cases, the microorganisms were mutated. In no case that I know of is there an example where any of these organisms has caused any kind of problem. The purpose of this is just to tell you not to be afraid of microorganisms just because they're microorganisms. The next slide, uh, here's an example of a rhizobium, uh, this, this is soybean, this pot had been inoculated with a rhizobium that has been used commercially in the Midwest for more than a decade. And it's possible to isolate the organism and genetically manipulate it and make the organism do better what it normally does, which is fixes, fixes nitrogen for the plant. And here are plants that are more vigorous, they fix more nitrogen. And these are the organisms that are added to these plants have been genetically altered. So it's possible with genetic engineering to improve useful organisms. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, this says, uh oh. Well, there have been, fortunately, there have been debates on this issue, and I think more and more, the people who were concerned, at least about plant, putting plants out in the environment, uh, are becoming much less concerned. But uh, there's a little bit more concern about putting microorganisms, genetically engineered microorganisms, out into the environment. Because microorganisms are invisible, they're known to cause terrible diseases, and people are, who haven't had experience in microbiology, uh, naturally are somewhat more concerned. What's the chance by genetically engineering an organism that we would consider safe or safe enough to put out in the field uh, by converting that organism into a problem pathogen? I think the chance is extraordinarily low. And Again, the scientific basis for this, somewhat parallel to the argument I used for the weed situation. A pathogen, I'm talking about microorganisms, yeast, I mean uh, fungi and bacteria, uh, pathogens are pathogens, not because they contain a single gene. On the, a pathogen, I'll give you an example, is a pathogen because it may contain a gene for a toxin, but that's not sufficient. It may need a gene or genes so that it, the organism can overcome host defense mechanism. 
or there may be genes so it can survive in between hosts. And as we're learning more and more about microbial ecology and about the molecular basis of pathogenesis, uh, it's not a single gene. It's, again, a complex of genes, very specific genes, interacting in very specific ways to make an organism into a problem pathogen. In other words, one that could spread readily and cause grief by either infecting animals, us, or, or plants. In fact, uh, one of the leading scientists at Stanford, Stan Falco, who, who studies the molecular biology of pathogenesis, says that he couldn't, even with lots of resources available, he couldn't purposely convert an organism to be considered safe into one that could be a problem pathogen. So to do it accidentally, by taking genes from any organism, for the purpose of trying to make an organism into an agriculturally useful organism, the chance for converting it into a problem pathogen is extraordinarily low. It's something I wouldn't worry about. There are 20 million, on the average, there are 20 million cells per cubic inch of soil. And these cells, these are micro, microorganisms. And these cells are continually dividing, they're continually mutating. They exchange genetic material uh, with with uh, their cousins, with their related organisms. And there's more and more evidence now that, org that there's some exchange of material even with unrelated organisms. So there's evidence that genes may be exchanged between, say, animal and bacteria and a bacteria to a plant and so on. In most cases where, let's, let's say, a bacterium has taken up an, uh, a plant gene in most cases, that plant gene won't do anything good for the organism. It won't give it a selective advantage, and so that organism will not predominate. In some rare cases, where there is a selective advantage, then the organism can predominate, and that's called evolution. Well, I believe that what's, what will happen through genetic engineering is going to be minuscule and ecologically insignificant compared to what occurs naturally or continually and randomly in nature. Now, there have been some, the press has been bad at this. They say uh, genetic, they're, it's, a, it's a nice story. Uh, people are concerned about genetic engineering because they don't want another Bhopal, Three Mile Island, or Love Canal. Could I have the next slide, please? This is just a picture of Bhopal, of the Union Carbide plant in India in Bhopal. Well, here am I, a representative from industry, telling you that my technology is safe, and certainly the builders of the Bhopal plant signed off saying that that the plant was safe. What is the relevance of these chemical problems, uh, including Three Mile Island, it's the chemical problems are radioactive chemical. Uh, what's the relevance of these problems to what might occur through genetic engineering? Well, in all of these cases, we're dealing with a dangerous chemical, and everybody involved would agree that they're dealing with a dangerous chemical. In the case of, meth of uh, Bhopal, the chemical is called methyl isocyanate. And everybody knows that methyl isocyanate is dangerous. So there's a real, there's a potential for a problem by uh, uh, producing methyl isocyanate, by utilizing it, by storing it, by disposing it, or by transporting it. In other words, if you were on a truck carrying methyl isocyanate and somebody bumped into the rear of the truck, I would be very, very concerned. Whereas there's no apparent danger that can come from a recombinant organism, let's say a truck full of uh, organisms that have come out of a fermenter. It's, I, I believe it's quite a different situation. Quite a different situation.
The next slide, please. Well, it's ironic that I think most of the activity going on in genetic engineering of, uh, with regard to agriculture is aimed to uh, replace some of the pesticides we, we use, or if not replace them, give us the option of using smaller amounts of pesticide or using safer pesticides. I just read that 20% of Illinois farmers, I assume the same thing is true in Minnesota, 20% of Illinois farmers have gone to their physician at least once due to a pesticide-related problem. There are 400 species of agricultural pests that have become resistant to pesticides. We're learning more and more that these pesticides get into our food. In other words, we eat the pesticides, and there's evidence or indications that some of these pesticides may have potential to cause things like cancer. Well, if we're worried, if people are worried about putting, genetic, putting gene, genetically altered organisms into the environment, let's see what happens, let's compare genetic engineering, what happens through genetic engineering with what happens with the use of pesticides. When uh, millions of acres are treated with insecticides, and one routinely finds insecticide-resistant insects, millions of acres are year after year uh, sprayed with herbicides, and we always see uh, herbicide-resistant weeds. Also with the use of herbicides, that uh, one gets mutant microorganisms in the soil, all kinds of microorganisms that are mutated so that they can degrade the pesticide, the, the herbicide, more effectively. And in this way, uh, that herbicide can't be used the following year, or if it is used, the farmer has to use more of it. So in all of these cases, the organisms, the insecticide-resistant insects, the herbicide-degrading uh, bacteria, the, the herbicide-resistant weeds, they can be disseminated by their normal natural uh, means, and they can also exchange their genes with guys they normally exchange genes with. Uh, so, by the use of pesticides, you, we get uncharacterized genetic changes in problem organisms. With genetic engineering, you get characterized genetic changes in safe organisms. Again, quite a difference. Well, to summarize the safety issue, I believe that the chance of producing a problem organism through recombinant DNA technology, through genetic engineering, is going to be less than the chance of producing problem organisms through practices that we now accept and manage. Regulations are evolving with how to handle putting uh, recombinant organisms out into the field. There's a tremendous amount of activity going on by the Environmental Protection Agency, the United States Department of Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institutes of Health. I'm hoping that the regulations that do evolve will take rational arguments uh, by the scientists, by uh, public advocacy groups, environmentalists, etc., and should not be led by the vivid imaginations that any new technology, especially one that's kind of sexy like this is, any new technology inspires. I'd like the next slide, please. That's in a newspaper. Maybe that could be a good topic of the next Nobel conference. Uh, and the next slide, please. And the next slide. Well, this is a very exciting time. The technology is at an early stage, and we're beginning to utilize its first products. I predict that our future will be considerably improved by use of this technology, and as I said before, it will be safer than technologies that will be displaced. It's kind of back to nature. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Brill, for taking us into the world of uh, agriculture and genetic research. Uh, as the lights come back up, perhaps our other participants would come to the front and we can begin our discussion. Professor, uh, Professor Brill's talk has taken us into the world of genetic research and agriculture, following up on Professor Kevla's talk, which was about genetic research in human beings and applying genetic research to, to the human animal. I'd like to elicit comments from the panelists, but, but I'd like to begin with a question myself, if Dr. Brill will allow me. Uh, I wonder, uh, Winston, how, how you account for the persistence of the concern on the part of ecologists, many of whom have a considerable number of degrees in, uh, in microbiology, it seems to me, uh, who, who persist in uh, not accepting your argument, uh, in suggesting that, uh, that in fact, there, there are dangers here, and I suspect maybe it comes down to the danger, as, as one of my colleagues said to me, uh, what if you're wrong? Okay, that's... Let me just write that down, what if you're wrong, because that's important. Uh, I don't think it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's not a matter of genetic engineer versus ecologists. There are, a, there are a few ecologists, probably no more than a handful that I know of, who have expressed concern. I know many more than a handful who, who, uh, aren't concerned. They're interested, but they haven't, they're not afraid, and they, they uh, I think, have the same kind of sense that I have. And it's, but there are also some recombinant DNA people who have expressed concern. And again, it's been a minority. So it's not ecologist versus, versus molecular biologist at all. Uh, the ecologists, basically the ecologists that have expressed concern are ecologists who who have been studying some of these upsetting things. I mean, they all have their different system, but uh, the starling, the, the, uh, the uh, gypsy moth, and so on, and really haven't considered what happens at the genetic level. And so what they've been focusing on for their, most of their careers have been problems that can occur from a live organism, and they're very, very sensitive to that. And, and we, need, we definitely need that population. Uh, that's basically it. And, and part of it is, what if I'm wrong? But anybody can say that about any technology. Uh, I'm quoting other people now, but we inject our children with uh, millions of doses of certain vaccines. And some people have said, well, how do we know that with those vaccines, we're not also including some virus or agent that will cause cancers, perhaps even cancers that won't catch 20 years from now. And as, we, as we've had more and more experience with these, we can't say, well, we know for absolutely surety that these vaccines are safe, but based on our experience and our best estimates at the time, we feel that we're safe and we're doing some very important things for people while, while we're pursuing that. But every technology, one, I mean, the disadvantage we have in arguing the case, especially with politicians, is that they're sensitized to that, what if you're wrong? And that's all they, I mean, that's where it stops. And they really don't have the patience to listen to the arguments. Uh, you can say, what if you're wrong with the Teosinte corn cross? And that's, that's the level, I think, of where we are. We have experience with recombinant DNA technology of over a decade. Certainly, uh, lab laboratory organisms have gotten out into the environment. Probably millions of different kinds of laboratory organisms have from a laboratory. Even if you wear a lab coat, you can get a so the little droplet can contain hundreds of thousands of organisms, which can get in your shoe, on your hand, and you go out into the environment. So we do have some experience with recombinant DNA technology in 
all kinds of organisms. And I think more importantly, we have experience with the traditional practices that the recombinant DNA isn't going to be, isn't going to change organisms that radically, or if it does change the organism that radically, it's a dead organism. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kevlis has a comment. Well, apropos, your, apropos your last point, uh, my understanding was that in the case of microorganisms with recombinant DNA, at least in the beginning, uh, a strain of E. coli was used that was known not to have tremendous chance of survival outside the laboratory environment. Uh, it seems to me the case with um, plants is different. I mean, you do want them to survive outside the laboratory environment, environment for openers. But secondly, it would seem to me to be difficult to predict, given their survivability outside the laboratory environment, just what uh, impact they might have upon the overall ecological balance of the given environment. I'm curious to know, first of all, how you actually assess that uh, in a concrete case. I don't have the slightest idea, and I think maybe our audience would be interested to know that at not too technical a level. And secondly, how do you think decisions about whether these things ought to be released into the environment, plants, I mean, uh, genetically engineered plants, how should those decisions be made? Where should uh, uh, the nexus of power and authority in society lie? Should it lie with you folks entirely, or, or us, or, or, or how? Well, how, do, how does one assess, the first question is really, how does one assess whether you, what the potential for problems will be with a plant that you've just genetically engineered to do, presumably to do something useful. It's no different from the traditional practices, which is the business of the plant breeder who takes a plant <laughs> and runs a small plot and compares that to, to the best plant around, to its controls. And a plant, and, and this, this continually, uh, experiments, in fact, sometimes take a decade because they first try it, they first try their new plant, whether it comes from a Teosinte cross or two different varieties of corn, they try it in a small plot and hopefully they see something that, that makes it better. Then they try it in a larger plot, then they try it in, over many seasons, over many environments. And really, that's, that's the experience they get. And some, sometimes uh, mistakes are made, and a plant becomes a commercial plant, and it turns out to be susceptible to a major disease. So there was a corn blight in 1970 that caused havoc in the Midwest. But that was easily overcome. I mean, it was an economic problem for a year, but, but there was nothing ecological, really. When you're talking about ecological, Every plant, every crop we grow, in fact, just the growing of crops, does something ecologically, changes the types of insects that hang around these crops, the kinds of microbes that hang around the crops, uh, and that's accepted. And no problems have occurred from that kind of practice. Uh, similarly, I think, because we're going to make even less of a change in the plant, that the chance for anything unexpected is going to be much, much less. So the testing is a testing that the that agricultural communities have been involved with for, for many, many decades. And universities, all state universities, have extension programs to look at some of the new varieties and farms. And so that's the traditional way and perhaps the only way. I think there's been some talk about let's come up with a laboratory test to see if organism X has potential for causing problems. And while that would be very desirable, I think we're decades and decades away from that. The... There's a question to my mind about the economics and sociology of these new technologies. and. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to ask if, in your view and, and the view of people who are working in this area, whether you see these new technologies as, as say, accelerating the demise of the traditional family farm, or is it going to be a sort of technology that will be equally available to everyone? You know, what sort of 
economic and sociological effects will this thing have? I, I'm not an expert in this area, but there's a lot of discussion going on in this area, and especially with the uh, increase uh, with c cattle with growth hormones. There's predictions that, in fact, it will displace the small farmer. And uh, there's no question that agriculture will change, will change with or without genetic engineering. Uh, I think that's really all I can say is I, I, I know there are people involved in, in looking at the impacts of this, and certainly since the big companies are very involved with this uh, and they're after the money of the, big, of the major farmers, I think it will be basically directed towards the big farmer. But it's, you can look at it another way and say that it may be useful for the small farmer because one problem the small farmer has is purchasing the pesticides and the, and the ag chemicals that they use and hopefully the plants that will be generated and the microorganisms that will be generated will decrease the need for these, for these uh, materials. So it's, it's, I think it's complex and it, I can't give you a proper answer. Let me answer Dan's second question. Who should make the decisions? Well, un, until now, uh, first of all, there are no regulations that govern industries uh, and there are a number of industries who had the opportunity to put genetically engineered organisms out into the environment. And every industry has tried to comply with the guidelines that uh, Dan mentioned, uh, the NIH recombinant DNA guidelines that was mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, everybody's complied. The decision should be made by by everybody in uh, being involved, really. So it's it's the uh, it's the economists and the and the uh, regulatory agencies and the industries, the scientists. It should be based on knowledge, not one person going off half cocked, which is my biggest concern. Professor Luria, well, I just wanted to reinforce something that Dr. Brill said, which I don't think is often understood by in the public or certainly from the newspapers. What is important in genetic engineering as applied to whether to animal husbandry or to plant breeding and so on, or to protection against plant diseases, that in general, what one aims to do is in a sense much more selective and precise than when you do, for example, when you breed two varieties in order to select more resistant to disease and so on. What you're trying to do and what you can do is to bring in one gene that is the one that interests you with the minimum amount of complication of the genetic structure as a whole. The less, of course, extraneous genetic material you bring, the more sure you are that you have only affected the characteristic. It's, in general, I think I would feel in principle, much safer in using material which has been produced in this way than in trying, for example, to breed varieties of animals as has been done for, for hundreds and thousands of years in order to find one which is more suitable. We know very well what this has happened to sheep and so on in many cases in which people have rushed to put hybrids into the field much too soon. In this case, I think one has at least the confidence that the minimum amount of genetic reassortment has been accomplished. Dr. Nelson, I think you have a comment to make. Uh, yes, I want to raise a question which is also uh, sociological, also economic and political. In the uh, slide you showed uh, the headlines from newspapers, I was struck by the headline that says uh, Genentech foot and mouth vaccine could find major markets after third world trials. And I was a little puzzled about the third world here. Does that mean because uh, that is where the foot and mouth disease is found? Uh, that is outside the US Congress, where it's often referred to. <laughs> but uh, is, is it only in the third world where this is a problem? If so, then the headline would uh, be unexceptional, I think. However, I've heard it uh, often said by various kinds of critics that, uh, ex that companies in the United States 
are more likely to go to uh, Africa, to South America, to Asia to try out their products, whether they be pharmaceuticals or any other kind of genetically engineered product, in order to see whether they work, because in this country, the FDA or the EPA or the other agencies won't allow them to trial here. Uh, now, is that uh, a real problem in uh, agricultural genetics? Okay, well, I can't really speak for Genentech, but uh, first of all, it is not a problem in the United States, but it is a problem in other con many other countries in the world. Uh, it's, it's a disease that can spread readily, so it's a concern of the United States, and there's a special island on the East Coast called Plum Island, where research for foot and mouth disease, the only place in the country where research for foot and mouth disease can occur, where they, where they are working on the organism because they want to have a vaccine available should it come into the United States. Uh, so the incentives are both in, within the country and outside of the country. There's Europe, I think, is also very concerned about the foot and, foot and mouth disease, and I think there have been some major outbreaks. Uh, I, as a matter of testing it in, in uh, third world countries, I think this is a slightly different issue. First of all, these vaccines made through recombinant DNA are, I think, 100%, I mean, except for an allergic reaction, potentially, they either aren't going to work, or if they work, they should be totally safe, because there's no chance of getting a disease from it, as you do with vaccines that are currently used. In fact, that's one of the beauties of some of the vaccines that are made through recombinant DNA, where all you inject into, a per into a, an animal or person is a single protein, uh, whereas that will replace a vaccine where what you inject is a virus that's either heat killed, is either killed in some manner, or has been mutated so it's not virulent. And there have been a number of cases where these have not been perfect, where people have been killed by vaccines, or virus vaccines, not being killed totally or not or reverting to, uh, to become pathogenic. The question that you raised, however, Dr. Nelson, is very important. The fact is that the rules for putting materials on the market in the United States are fortunately the strictest of any countries, except possibly Switzerland. But it is fact, it has nothing to do with genetic engineering, that our large pharmaceutical companies have always tried their new drugs in countries that have more lax regulations before trying them, before putting them on the market in this country. The recent scandal of Oriflex is only the most recent one of a long story in which companies do uh, trials wherever they are allowed to do trials. That's some of the fact that the large companies have a power that goes, in a sense, beyond that of the wisdom of, our, of governments. And they can do this because there are other parts of the world in which governments do not protect their people as strictly as our tries to. We have received a number of interesting questions from the audience. We won't get an opportunity to answer all of them right now. Many of, many of them for not only this, but the other lectures that we've heard, uh, we'll be able to answer it in the panel discussion uh, tomorrow. But uh, Professor Brill, I know, has a question before him uh, that he'd like to address. So let me turn attention that way. Okay. The question is, how do you change the genetic structure of an entire tree or plant on the cell by cell basis. Okay, well you have one cell, as I said in the slide, and you insert your foreign gene into the chromosome. And the cell will then grow, become larger, and become two cells. And now you've got two copies of the chromosome, each with a foreign gene. And then as you keep on multiplying cells, a tree or a plant consists of millions and millions of cells. Now you have millions and millions of cells, all with the foreign gene. If that foreign gene is, let's say, to make some uh, insecticide, then the insecticide will be produced in the plant tissues, and insects that chew on the plant will, will die. I hope that answers it. Let me just list a series of questions, if you will, Winston, and I'll just sort of fire them out here at you, questions we've received from the audience, and you can perhaps give brief replies to them. 
all right? For instance, do you feel that the frost-resistant microbe should be field tested? I believe, yes, I do. Uh, I've heard many people discuss that microorganism, and I haven't seen any basis to believe uh, that it could create any kind of problem. What are your answers to the questions raised by those opposed to field testing? Well, they have to say why they're opposed. And if they're opposed because of Bhopal, then I say what I said before. If they're opposed because of uh, gypsy moth, then I, s I give them what you've heard. And that's basically been it. Somebody who's opposed to it because it's unnatural, uh, that's their prejudice or whatever. And it's very hard. It's, it's more difficult to argue. Okay. What about anhydrous ammonia placed on fields to produce nitrogen for our crops? Uh, hydrogen ammonia kills all the worms, which are here to disseminate the soil and hold and renew the elements. Will not our soil become dead? I don't think there's any evidence that treating soil with uh, anhydrous ammonia really kills the soil. It certainly kills insects and microorganisms, but they it doesn't kill them all in the field, and they readily come back. All right. To what extent can a morally responsible scientist in industry refuse to carry out research he finds contrary to his ethics without getting fired if his non-science non superiors consider the research financially advantageous? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think uh, as... Dr. Luria really mentioned it's it's an individual morality has to should take precedence. Uh, some people are stronger than others, and I guess in some cases they can change the way things are going. If you, if you don't say anything, uh, you don't have much character. But I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> okay. Do you see potential military abuses of recombinant DNA research, say, in bacteriological or chemical warfare? Uh, that's, uh, there have been quite a few discussions on that. Uh, in fact, I went to the State Department a couple of years ago and listened to a debate on that. And my belief is that if somebody wants to if, if one wants to get involved in germ warfare, there are a whole lot of germs out there that are readily available and one doesn't have to use recombinant DNA technology for. Uh, as I said in my talk, that I think it's going to be extremely difficult to make an organism worse than any organism that we now have, where I think the I mean, there were some articles in the Wall Street Journal saying that Russia has an active germ warfare program getting, uh, using recombinant DNA, or at least their laboratories that are into this. Um, that hasn't been substantiated, and I, pred I don't predict success in, from what I've heard, the kinds of experiments that they're trying to pursue. For instance, putting a very bad toxin gene into a microorganism. Uh, there are reasons to believe that if one did so, that microorganism wouldn't just grow and multiply in the environment and, and be very pre prevalent. What it would do is die very quickly. And so if you wanted to spray the toxin, it's easier just to spray the toxin than the microorganism with the toxin. Where there is some activity going on seems to be defensive. In other words, I think countries are saying what might another country do? And the other thing, and what they might do is not, uh, not involve the genetic engineering experiment. For instance, if somebody wants to spray a toxin around, uh, just throw it out in the environment. Uh, this way there may be a vaccine produced here against that toxin. So people are, are talking about that. But I think, I, c I can't imagine using genetic engineering to make an organism worse than any organism I can get right now. Thank you. Before I turn the microphone over to Chaplain Elvie,
Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Brill for a stimulating talk uh, and our other panelists as well for their cooperation.